I was just asked, you said something in the last sentence about venting. Did I, did I mean inventing? What did I say? Anyone, can anyone help me? Because I'm denting. not sure. It's not, de it's not venting, it's denting. Oh, it's denting. Denting. Like, a, like, the, like you dent a car. It's yeah. like, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And she thanks you too. That, uh, and, and that reminds me of another uh, uh, thing about perfection or imperfection, that um, some of us, our memories aren't as good as we would like them to be. And uh, so uh, I realized this, that I could get in the car and drive um, down the road, and then I would go, oh, I forgot. And then I could have either go back to the house and get it, or I could just drive on without it. But what happened was I didn't forget. At that moment, I remembered. If you, if you forget, you never remember. And so you remember, which is what you want to do, and then you start going down this road of getting hard on yourself because you've done something you want to do, which is remember. And uh, we get into these convoluted uh, uh, situations with ourselves, and um, it's really good to do some investigation and uh, really look deeply and uh, remember when you do remember to encourage that. Uh, it's like uh, getting down on yourself for remembering. It just doesn't make sense. Now, on the other hand, here's another situation that we can find ourselves in. Uh, and that is that, uh, let's say you went to a, uh, a a dinner party or out to dinner with friends and you've been feeling really good and you've been smiling a lot and happy the whole night. And then you go to the bathroom and you look in the mirror and you got spinach in your teeth there. And all evening you've been smiling with the spinach in your teeth and you're kind of feeling like an idiot. Uh, well, I'll tell you what, a humility is good. <laughs> uh, that uh, And it's no big deal, again, uh, getting uh, hard on yourself for something like that. It's, it's not a big deal. And if you do feel a little more humble, that's good. Um, but it's all appearance. It has nothing to do with our Buddha nature. And that's what's really important is to remember that all these little things that go on in our lives, uh, they don't affect our Buddha nature. And this is what we want to bring out is our Buddha nature. So let me see here. Um, another point that I want to make is a competition that um, there are a lot of different ways that we uh, can be competing, that uh, we can be comparing ourselves with others. And uh, frequently it results in being envious of others, that uh, they seem to be smarter than we are, younger than, than we are, uh, having better circumstances than we have, and so many other different things. My neighbor and his wife have an incredibly beautiful lawn, very well landscaped gardens, flowers. This morning at 5.30, I was in the kitchen, I looked out my window, and he had a he was sprinkling something on his lawn Sunday morning, 5.30 in the morning. Well, okay. 
don't expect me to be out on my lawn sprinkling things. That just means it, it's going to grow faster and I have to mow it more. Uh, and uh, it's so, uh, it's good to kind of let go of this comparison with other people. And uh, nowadays they have these sports that are considered non-competitive. And um, well, uh, this is something that I saw quite a while ago. And that was, I was staying in Chicago and there as a person jogging down the street and this was a busy street in Chicago and they came to a stop sign and they touched it with their hand and then looked at their watch. Obviously they're competing with themselves. And uh, so it's good to not compete with yourself either, especially with meditation, thinking, oh, but this meditation session it's going to be better than the last one, or it better be better than the last one, or I'm a failure or whatever, that you have to let go of these things. Uh, I like to say when you are wondering if your meditation practice is working or you're seeing progress, it's not what goes on when you are meditating and what goes on when you're not meditating, when you're out in the world. Are you a little more relaxed? Are you a little less... Um, are you harder to uh, get provoked into anger or resentment or desire? Are you a little bit able, more able to say, okay, that's fine. I, I can accept that. Uh, are you a little more open to other people? I had an inmate uh, tell me this one time, and he had been doing regular meditation practice back in his room, uh, and he came down to uh, my... Uh, uh, down to my, uh, I, the office isn't quite the right word, but the room next to my office where I would lead meditation and we'd do chanting and so forth. And, and he said, you know, there's a lot of suffering in this institution. And it's not just the inmates, it's the guards. That his mind had calmed down enough so that he was not just seeing his own uh, his own problems, his own suffering, his own difficulty, that he was able to see what was beyond that. He could start seeing what other people were experiencing. And it was a very good sign that uh, the meditation was calming his mind down. I remember attending a program that uh, Mingyur Rinpoche led. Uh, and uh, so first we had a, uh, a session, a short session of sitting meditation. And after that, he said, now, how many of you had very few thoughts? And a number of people raised their hands. He said, oh, that's very good. And then he said, how many of you had a lot of thoughts? And there were a lot of hands that went up. And he said, oh, that's very good. Uh, both groups were aware of whether they were having a lot of thoughts or only a few thoughts. So that's what's most important in meditation is the awareness So no competition with yourself or with others and uh, just awareness, you know, work on awareness. Uh, 
Uh, I've talked about this before this morning, but I'm going to come back to it a little bit. And that is about mindfulness, that when you meditate, of course, you're going to have thoughts arising. Uh, and, well, that's all right. <laughs> I... Uh, and you probably will, over time, be aware of having certain thoughts keep coming up over and over again. Again, Mingya Rinpoche talks about it being like a soap opera. That, you know, the same emotions, the same people, over and over and over again. Uh, a long time ago, when I first got involved in Buddhism, I tried doing a, uh, a journal. I would write down at the end of the day the things that were on my mind, what I was most concerned with, and so forth. It was very interesting. After a couple of months, I started reading what I had written, and it, almost like every day was a soap opera, and it was reruns of the same old soap opera. And uh, so it's good to get to know this soap opera and realize that, so what? You know, just let it go. Just let it go. Is it accurate? I mean, is it really accurate? Or are you uh, cherry picking certain things to convince yourself uh, that uh, this is what really is? going on that uh, what happens in our life is not so much what we experience that's the problem it's our thoughts about what we experience that uh, is the problem and the more we can be aware of this subconscious gossip uh, the more we can kind of go, well, maybe so, maybe not, becomes easier to let go of it. That um, you could call that subconscious gossip a spin doctor, to use modern language, that it's just putting a very biased uh, viewpoint on, and it's not seeing things really very clearly. The uh, a good analogy is uh, muddy water. That if you have a uh, let's say a mason jar of muddy water with a top on it, and you're shaking it up and shaking it up, well, it's muddy water. You can't see through it. But if you set it down on a table and just let it sit for a few hours, maybe overnight, the mud settles to the bottom and the national, a natural clarity of the water appears. It was always there. And if we can let our minds settle down, the natural clarity that we have will uh, become apparent. And uh, it, it, we're thinking about this soap opera, this spin that we're putting on our experience. There's no clarity. It's just the same old, same old reruns. And um, so we need to get to know that inner voice, that inner critic, and we need to be able to let go of it and realize that it really is giving a very, very biased opinion. And mindfulness really can help this way, paying attention and then letting go. Uh, one of my favorite examples comes from the, uh, the Wizard of Oz. Uh, I know some of you have heard me say this before. This was a scene in this movie that was made, I think, in 1938. What does that make it there? Almost, what, 85 years old? Anyway, you have Dorothy and her three friends, the Scarecrow, the Tin Woodsman, 
the cowardly lion, and then, of course, her dog, Toto. Uh, and they're coming to the wizard, and they're all asking for something from him. And he's supposed to be this all-powerful wizard that can grant them their wishes. And they come into the castle, and there you have this projection on a wall of this face looking fierce and large, and then this loud, booming voice coming in, you know, from seemingly nowhere, and there are flames shooting up on either side of the face that's being projected on the wall, and you hear, I am the wizard. And they're all afraid. And um, they ask, Dorothy asks what uh, that, uh, and he says oh, things like, uh, no, not now. And she insists. And then he gets really uh, gruff and angry. And then Toto goes over to this curtain and pulls his curtain back. And there behind the curtain is this old gray haired man speaking into a microphone. And he's got these levers that he's moving up and down that's causing the whole thing. And uh, Dorothy looks at him and he looks at Dorothy and he turns into his microphone and says, don't pay attention to the man behind the curtain. And of course, it's too late. And the reason why I bring this up is we have to pay attention to the person behind our curtain or the uh, the woman or the man that's telling us these things that make us afraid or make us passionate or make us angry and so forth. And the more we pay attention to that inner voice, the closer we come to liberating ourselves from it. So again, this is where mindfulness comes in paying attention, letting go of the things that we hold on to, and, um, and so here I have a quote from Karmapa again. I'm not sure exactly where this comes from, but here's the quote. Your most important home is your own mind more than any other. You've got to come back to that home to get to know it a little bit better. And when you rest in your home, even for one moment, it might be the most beautiful rest you ever have. That is the beginning of finding meaning in your life. That is the beginning of making peace with yourself. So this just re-emphasizes what I've been talking about, that we need to get to know ourselves very well, warts and all, mistakes and all, imperfections and all, and realize that we still have Buddha nature, that it's a workable situation, that there are plenty of techniques available for us to work with this, that we can um, we can develop ourselves, we can follow the teachings, that we can be that uh, kind, loving mother that I talked about this morning, that uh, this is how we progress in life. So um, I, I, I've been kind of jumping around a little bit, but here is a, a, um, an exercise that I would like to do. It's one on um, learning to be kind to yourself. I have to bring it up. I've got it somewhere. Uh, I call it... Um, um, well, it's a type of Tonglen, uh, learning how to um, 
to be kind to yourself. I call it, uh, uh, one of the names I have for it is prison break. And so let me bring this up here. Uh, Okay, this is what it is. And again, it is a, it's a bit like Tong Len. And uh, so I started out with a quote. Um, let's see here. Well, I'm just going to read it. And if you want a copy of this, I could uh, make a copy available one way or another. S so I'm just going to read this first of all. People who have experienced trauma can live in a prison, a prisoner of their past. Even though they haven't experienced trauma for years, even decades, they are behaving like it is still happening. It is a prison of habitual patterns, impulsive reactions, anxiety, compulsive behavior, self-loathing, suffering and unhappiness. It is familiar, normal, and therefore somewhat comfortable. When one experiences actual trauma, it's out of your control. Uh, if it was under your control, you could have stopped it. This prison that you are in uh, uh, is... <clears throat> excuse me, you're in control in this prison and it has a familiar feeling about it. It feels safer. Uh, it's actually common for inmates when they get released, if they've been in prison for a long time, to feel more comfortable in prison than outside of prison. So uh, with that then, uh, uh, this is this practice of Tonglen that I am leading into, and then we're going to do a little Tonglen here. Uh, like an actual prison, there are many different locks and matching keys keeping you from escaping. One is made of fear, fear of uncertainty. Locks can also be made of habitual patterns. Self-loathing is a third lock. One feels familiar, painful, uh, comfortable, and safe. But you can be uh, imprisoned and confused and not even recognize what happiness is. Uh, I actually had one person, I asked them about if they're happy. And their response was, uh, oh, happiness is such a vague concept. So um, uh, a person in this self-imposed prison, self-created prison, will have thoughts of guilt, anger towards themselves, self-loathing, anxiety, messages like, I constantly fail, I'm not as good as others. It can get uh, very nasty with thoughts such as, I am a... I'm putting in expletive deleted, uh, idiot. I'm a terrible person. I might as well kill myself. That uh, just thinking that you are totally bad. And uh, they take that this inner voice is serious and is telling the truth. So the key is love and compassion. Uh, and this makes it a totally workable situation. So first of all, the person that is in this self-created uh, jail needs to have the desire to break out, to escape. 
that there's no release date, that uh, no one's going to come in and lock, unlock the door for you. Then you need to recognize this inner voice, this uh, that's telling you all these negative things, and uh, you have to realize that you are as valuable as anybody else. You are a human, and you are as valuable as any other human. And you can learn to love yourself without having to earn it. Uh, I heard this saying once from a middle-aged Tibetan woman. If you have a warm place in your heart for yourself, you will be comfortable wherever you go. So that warm place is one of love and compassion towards yourself. And uh, there is a practice that you can do to encourage that warm place. Again, remember that you are worthy of being a recipient of love and compassion. that you will be a happier person with a warm place in your heart. So the way to nurture this is through this Tong Len exercise. So imagine yourself or visualize yourself sitting in front of you and um, sit cross-legged on a cushion if you can and then do this exchange that I think of how uh, you are suffering and how you would like to remove that suffering, this idea of, that you have towards yourself as somehow being uh, inferior, not worthy, feeling of guilt, uh, whatever it is that you realize that you're holding on to. Uh, when you inhale, imagine that you are taking this negativity out in the form of black smoke that comes into your lungs and then it dissolves in your lungs and when you exhale you are giving that you in front uh, love kindness acceptance happiness and so forth and uh, as I mentioned this morning, the person in front of you is a future you. Let's say five minutes, uh, a you five minutes into the future. And uh, so uh, you do this inhaling black smoke, which has whatever it is that you are down on yourself at the present time. And when you exhale, it. Uh, what will make you happy and remedy the negativity comes out in the form of white light and is soaked up by the future you in front. And uh, it could be uh, it could be anything that you are visualizing, but whatever it is that uh, you can think of at the present time, you don't have to go through a whole long laundry list just once or two. One or two things. It could be it. Uh, uh, it could be uh, that um, uh, yet you are feeling badly because of something that you did yesterday or something you did ten minutes ago. And again, inhale it, suck it out of the person in front, and then give back the remedy. And. Um, uh, again, love here means fondness, tenderness, warmth. Uh, going into the places that might ordinarily scare you. And uh, treating this future you with love, kindness. Uh, giving that future you contentment or satisfaction, cheerfulness, joy delight, any of these things, forgiveness, and so forth, whatever will make you happy. Uh, and about that inner voice, uh, make friends with it, but realize sometimes your friends give you bad advice and you don't have to believe it. 
So there's two ways you can re relate to this. A, as in the Wizard of Oz. B, as friends giving you bad advice that you don't have to follow. So uh, anyway, let's do this for a few minutes. And uh, then uh, I don't think, I'm going to try hitting the singing bowl. Let's see if you can hear it. You're going to see it even if you can't hear it.
Ding. I hit the singing bowl, but nobody heard. <laughs> well, uh, I have an announcement. Uh, you are now the future you. The old you is gone. History. Uh, so I'd like to have a little discussion now, if anyone has anything that they would like to say. Uh, Lama Yeshe, I'm I'm thinking about memories and uh, trauma. Yep. And forgiving seems easier than forgetting. Um, when a memory comes up uh, to deal with trauma, is there anything we can do on the spot to? shift that perspective or well um it depends it, it really depends but first of all memories are not solid that we're remembering from a per a certain perspective and that it's uh it's thoughts and it's interpretations so, um, uh, another way to put this is you can go to a museum and look at a statue. Could be looking at a statue that's very uh, well known. You can look at it from in front. You could look at it from the side. You could look at it from behind. You could imagine, you know, or you could look at just a part of the statue. What I'm getting at is that there's, you can look from many different ways at a piece of art and see it in different perspectives. And so you can look at a memory the same way. Mm -hmm. uh, here again is an experience that I had is uh, probably the second or the third grade was Halloween and mom made a Halloween costume for me to wear to school all day long. Now it sounds very nice, except it was my pajamas, the kind with a flap and back with the buttons. <laughs> and, uh, and it had rabbit ears on it. And I was very embarrassed wearing that all day long in front of my classmates and the teachers. Uh, well, a few years ago, I went to uh, Ecuador to visit a friend of mine. And while we were there, they had some kind of a public celebration and there was a parade. And there was one group in this parade uh, that their topic was sanitation. And there was a little girl dressed up as a roll of toilet paper. You know, like the cylinder was this way, so you could see her legs and you could see this part of her head. Next to her was a boy dressed as a toilet, complete with the seat, the bowl, and the tank. They weren't embarrassed. <laughs> Do you see where I'm going with this? Mm -hmm. That um, you can look at the whole thing from a very different perspective and suddenly uh, it's, it's a different memory. Mm -hmm. uh, when I look at things that happened to me that I used to really be upset about when I put in the factor that, well, mom had been sexually assaulted repeatedly and never been treated for this. Her father was an alcoholic. Uh, oh, you know, no wonder why she behaved the way she was. Uh, and uh, when you start looking beyond yourself, I think that's another way to put it. 
mm -hmm. and yourself and your little narrow vision, it starts opening up and there's a lot more space, a lot more space. And um, uh, that uh, it's not an all or nothing. It's not an instant. But if you can start thinking that way, mm -hmm. then little by little by little, uh, things can change. I know scientifically that there have been studies that if you bring up an, uh, a memory and then you change the way you look at it, you know, like the memory has a very negative connotation to it. And then you start seeing it's from a little different perspective and it's not so negative. Then when it goes back into your, you know, it's like you bring these things up from the hard drive, uh, like a document, and then you edit, modify it, and then put it back down there. Well, it's a different document. So if you have a memory, bring it up, modify it a little bit, put it back down, and it's a different memory. Seriously, I, I think there's studies that show this. So with practice, you can change it in your consciousness. Yes, exactly. Uh, among other things, you could start thinking about the suffering that the person that did it to you was experiencing. Or it's self-inflicted. <laughs> self-inflicted, yeah, whatever. Uh, whatever. Uh, uh, the Whatever it is, you know, think about uh, the uh, uh, the implications and uh, look at it differently than what you have been looking at. Um, again, I could talk about my own personal experience, which was um, Uh, well, let's just say mom was very, very, very difficult, very demanding. I had to be perfect. Uh, I had a psychiatrist. The last psychiatrist that I saw said that she was jealous mm -hmm. uh, of, you know, me being with girls or women. And, uh, well, put that in there. Well, no wonder why, because of the way she was treated when she was young and, um, start thinking about her suffering mm -hmm. and mama karma is here and he saw her when she was in her 90s and this might be partially this one of the things that i did was i started sneaking karmapa blessing pills into her food without telling her because if i would have said mom would you like a blessing pill it would have been uh. but i and she, he's for some reason or another, she got happier. <laughs> she uh, attended a Chenrezig uh, puja that I led. Uh, and it was the first time in her whole life that she ex expressed any interest in what I was doing. And all very good conditions came uh, to uh, lead her to want to be present and so she was present and at the end of the uh chen resi uh, i had a q a and then i ended and went up to her and she said excitedly oh you're a minister i always wanted you to be a minister and she was happy <laughs> whereas when i was in three-year retreat she was sending me articles about waco and the standoff there and thinking like we were armed with, uh, you know, assault rifles at Kate, at Karma Ling. <laughs> I, you know, well, now I'm a minister, it's okay. And then she became happy. And I remember Lama Karma taking Lama Karma to my folks. And afterwards we left, he said, she's very happy. She doesn't know why she's happy, but she's very happy. <laughs> <laughs> and she was she was she was very very happy uh, uh, it was the happiest I've ever seen her in her whole life mm -hmm. and I can't help but feel that the blessing pills and then the prayers that I said for her and so forth that it all had an effect mm -hmm. 
And Ken Pocarto Rinpoche said this too, and that is for people that have died, if you dedicate merit to them and include them in your prayers and so forth, they benefit from this, even if a hundred years ago. And so if there are people that you've had bad experiences with that are now dead, you can still benefit them. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you very much. So I like questions and I think that was a good one. Thank you for asking it. Anything, anybody else have anything they want to uh, add or ask? I don't see any mics uh, unmuted. Uh, if not, then I have a request. And that is, I need to take a break. Can we take a, uh, maybe a 10 minute bathroom break? I'll leave this uh, on, but I do have to take a break. So I'll see you in a few minutes. <clears throat>
I'm back. Ah. Oh, so I'm back here and uh, um, it was brought up that why is it that the bad memories come up more frequently than the uh, good memories? And I think that's a pretty good question. Frequently, it's the strength that brings up a, a, a past memory, you know, a, a, the strength of the memory. <clears throat> and, uh, but on the other hand, we don't have to be afraid of memories coming up that, uh, first of all, it can remind you uh, that you need to work on this a little bit. You could, for instance, look at that situation, as I've mentioned, in, from a different perspective, uh, look at it through different eyes, older eyes, since it's a memory, it's in the past, maybe wiser eyes. You could look at it that maybe the uh, other people involved in this memory were suffering a lot. There's a very simple saying that uh, I've heard a number of times, which is hurt people, hurt people. In other words, people that are hurt, they hurt other people. And to realize that the people that maybe hurt you were really hurting. You could even do Tong Len for them if you have the ability to do that. <clears throat> it can be difficult. But anyway, there are lots of different ways of looking at things, and um, things are not solid. That um, a memory is just a bunch of thoughts. And uh, thoughts, uh, if thoughts were real, then I could, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you how to save a lot of money. If thoughts were real, all you have to do is uh, <clears throat> just imagine eating supper tonight. And then tomorrow, and pretty soon you'll be able to eliminate going to the grocery store. And I mean, you probably spend hundreds of dollars uh, in no time at all in a grocery store. Just think of how much you'd save if thoughts were real. In fact, you could just do imaginary deposits in your bank account, too. Uh, just all kinds of things we could do if thoughts were real. But they're not. And uh, our thoughts can't hurt us either unless we think they're real. Now, does anyone want to comment on that one? I don't see any microphones being unmuted. I can comment. Okay. I guess, like, even though I know that thoughts aren't real, I do think that, like, you can obviously, like, harm yourself by attaching to your thoughts and giving them more weight and I guess one thing I think about too is how like sometimes having positive thoughts can actually have a beneficial effect too so even though thoughts aren't real they have an impact on what we experience thank you yes absolutely uh, Karvapa says to lean into the positive uh, that uh, there's no question that if you can be uh, leaning towards the positive, things will go better. Uh, again, from my personal experience, 
when I started to understand my depression, which was anger towards myself as well as anger towards the world, uh, and um, started to pay attention to what music I like to listen to. I was talking to Lama Karma about this when he was here. My, my favorite album at the peak of my depression was all about uh, uh, overdose from drug, uh, domestic violence, uh, failure, failed careers, failed this, failed that. Oh, I just loved it uh, because it reinforced this idea that I had of the world being a bad place and that I was a failure. And uh, yeah, pay attention to... Um, uh, again, that that person behind the curtain and uh, lean towards the positive. And uh, I started listening to uh, music that didn't have words to it, first of all. Secondly, I tried to pay attention to how listening to the music made me feel. And I just completely changed what I listened to for music. Same thing for watching, you know. If you get have nightmares after watching a horror movie, well, don't watch horror movies. You know, pay, pay attention to what you're putting in to your mind and put in positive things rather than uh, ne negative things uh, that... Um, uh, there's so much uh, positive things that are going on that we don't really connect with. That uh, the news is about what's new, and what's new is usually something bad going on. And I, I, I still watch the news, but it's just one view of you know what's going on, and that there's a lot more than that going on. It's good to uh, pay attention to just what's going on around you. That uh, there is so much good going on in the world, but it's not news. That um, there's a lot of funny things going on around us too. A lot of silly things. Uh, things that and humor is uplifting if it's done in a way that isn't making fun of somebody else or and so forth that you've heard my bird feeder story joke haven't you well I'll tell it maybe there's someone here that hasn't heard it I was at a, a farm and garden store local store called Fleet Farm and the man in front of me in the checkout line had a 25 pound bag of bird seed. And I told him, oh, your birds are gonna be happy when you get home. And he said, yeah, they get upset when there's no feed in the feeder. And I've had bird feeders too, and I know they get upset. So I, I made a joke. I said, well, at my house, when there's no feed in the feeder, the birds turn towards the house and they go, cheap, cheap, cheap. You know, like you're a cheapskate. You're supposed to be feeding me. And uh, needless to say, the customer buckled over at the waist laughing and the cashier she buckled over at the waist laughing and I'm thinking yes one for another laugh put into the world and two people and then it took the cashier quite a while to get composed enough to complete the sale in fact and then when she finally did get composed and completed the sale she looked at her next customer which was me and she buckled over again, laughing. <laughs> so, you know, we all have an opportunity to put a little humor into the world. Uh, and- Can I give a comment on that? That joke you also told me, 
and uh, the plate mark joke, and uh, I didn't get it. So you were buckled. Yeah. <laughs> so I didn't get it. So that was the joke. I didn't get it. You know, remember? Yeah. Yeah, he's got uh, he's got a cultural and a language barrier. <laughs> so you were a little bit buckled that I didn't get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'll tell you another. This comes. I remembered this too. This is a long time ago, when I was in the sixth grade. I I went to a summer camp for two months, and the counselors were college students. And this was uh, in the Lower Peninsula of Michigan by Traverse City, Michigan, if you know where that is. Close to the camp was a, uh, a Sleeping Bear National Wildlife Area or something. And uh, there are these two islands that are just offshore that the uh, Native American legend is that they were bears that and a mother and the cubs that couldn't make it. Uh, to shore and they turned into islands. So part of the camp, uh, us kids were taken to this um, Sleeping Bear National Park uh, and uh, some didn't go. And so the next morning at breakfast, uh, there were counselors, male and female counselors sitting at the table and the male counselor who didn't go asked the female counselor, uh, how did you enjoy sleeping bear? And of course, a six year, sixth graders, <laughs> and uh, like sleeping bear naked. <laughs> and of course, the poor woman got extremely embarrassed. But uh, it was a funny memory, let's put it that way. And I didn't try to change that into some other kind of memory. It was just a silly, funny memory. But really, there's humor going around us all the time. If we just see, open up a little bit, relax, that there is just um, uh, the contrast. It isn't. Um, well, anyway, I see a lot of humor. And sometimes Lama Karma laughs with me as opposed to laughing at me. <laughs> So, any any other comments or questions? Well, no mind yes, I've got a comment here, which is humor is healing, and uh, I am in a hundred percent agreement that. Uh, I remember a few years ago it was. Lama, were you there? Like when Kembo Mbuche went to India and we went to meet uh, in Simon Isatai Sudur Mbuche? I was there, yes. So I was sitting next to him and he was talking to all of us. You know, he basically, maybe that occasion or different occasion, you know, we would talk about like, uh, uh, <clears throat> you know, teaching. Uh, uh, and he said, uh, he basically actually it was I take that back. It wasn't about teaching, but he was basically said that please try to have a sense of humor. You know, if you don't have those, just try to learn it. So he said, sense of humor is uh, very very uh, important. So yeah, absolutely yes. Um, thank you, thank you. Um, and I can remember Rinpoche. Well, here's a story about Rinpoche. This was during the 10 day teachings. And um, so one afternoon, uh, Rinpoche, as he usually does, came out and um, I believe before he did prostrations, he put a little foam clown nose on his nose and then did his prostrations. And then he sat down, uh, or he may have done his prostrations and sat down and then put the, I think that's what, he put the clown nose on after 
he sat down and then we're prostrating to him and just laughing and laughing and laughing at the clown nose. And um, well, some of the uh, people present got inspired. And I think one of them was Lama Kathy's husband who used to be a clown. And uh, they scoured all the stores that they could find for clown noses. And they came back with, I think, around 50 of them. Mm -hmm. So a couple of days later, they distributed them to us. And when Rinpoche was done prostrating in the afternoon and then he sat down, we put these on and did our prostrations to him. And of course, Rinpoche got a huge kick out of this. And uh, when the room had calmed down and quieted down, he said, I'm pleased to see that you have all received the blessings of the guru. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, he's he had a, a, a very a good sense of humor. He also liked uh, toy dinosaurs. You probably remember that. He would, someone would give them, put them on his puja table, and then he would sometimes bring them out and play with them a little bit. Um, one more Rinpoche story. And this was in retreat. And I was having a bout of the beatings will continue until morale improves, getting down on myself. <clears throat> and um, it was at, Rinpoche would sometimes eat meals with the men in the men's dining room. And so I'm walking by him and he sees me and I've not talked to him about this. You don't have to, because he knows and he turns in his chair, sticks one leg out, pulls his robe up a little bit so he can see the leg and starts shaking it at me. And of course, I break out laughing. And that's obviously what he intended. And um, so, yeah, Rinpoche had a very good sense of humor. Yeah, Rinpoche, he, he made like a very, very like a special jokes in our own native language, you know, because Rinpoche and I talk in our own tones. His jokes I can't think of, you know, like so, so those are kind of ever last kind of laugh, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, like, uh, yeah. Rinpoche yeah. Like, uh, like sense of humor and he knows how to display on time. Yes. Yeah. Here's one more memory, which not so much his sense of humor, but just a little bit about him. This was in Chicago. The topic of the talk was the 10 non-virtuous actions. You know, it's a weekend program. So he has just finished talking about the four non-virtuous actions of speech, which are uh, lying, uh, creating disharmony, um, <clears throat> harsh words, and gossip. It's first question. The man said, this eliminates all normal speech. And Rinpoche laughed first that he understood that very well. Oh, look at that. He's present. Ah, oh, thank you. Yeah, Rinpoche yeah, laughed first. Yes. How wonderful. And he's got that nice smile, too. So, yeah, he understood English well enough. And he also saw the humor in that being, well, this eliminates all normal speech. So that's uh, another Rinpoche story. Well, we've got a half hour. Um, any other comments? 
I can continue. I remember that, you know, I was training as a Rinpoche's uh, interview translator. And I was sweating. It's so like, uh, you know, I never really, I came from, I mean, came from Tibet, you know, like uh, all of a sudden tried to translate for someone. You know, and my English wasn't so good. I was sweating at it. I translated everything. And uh, I thought I did a good job. I remember said, no, he didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> I thought he didn't know English at all. Like, and he, then he explained to me, and I said, he said this and that. I was like, oh, okay, that made him, you know, more sweater, sweat, not sweater, sweat. Mm -hmm. But he he knew how to uh, subdue your egos and uh, uh, sometimes, you know, have tough love. Uh, so, you know, which it was not someone like... Uh, uh, talked a lot, but sometimes give a you know look, right? Yes. So that's enough. That's how powerful he was. <laughs> oh yes, yes. I I got the look more than once. <laughs> uh, yes. Um, just feel for so fortunate having. Uh, him as a teacher, Kempo Kartar Rinpoche. Ah, yeah. Any other questions, comments? Uh, because I'm just going to go back to my uh, uh, my talk and see what I've got here. Um, well, um, very simply, since I talked about the 10 non-virtuous actions, that um, engaging in any of the 10 non-virtuous actions will cause unhappiness and uh, really go uh, contrary to loving yourself, that, uh, you know, there are three of body, which is uh, killing uh, stealing and uh, sexual misconduct, and these will just generate more inner unhappiness, inner conflicts, and so forth. And I talked about the four of speech, that uh, <clears throat> lying, uh, disharmony, harsh words, and uh, gossip, these will cause your mind to be unsettled the opposite, of course, are telling the truth, uh, uh, speaking in ways that uh, heal uh, relationships, uh, speaking in soothing, gentle words, and then finally, uh, speaking in a way that, uh, well, kind of like uh, what um, Lama Karma said about Rinpoche, having saying words that have meaning and uh, that uh, that gives you the, um, it lets other people know that what you're saying uh, is worth listening to. And then uh, the three of mind are envy, um, ill will, and then wrong view and uh, Envy is, you know, thinking that somebody else has a better deal than you have. I joke with my neighbor who has these donkeys across the road. Some of them are males, which makes them jackasses. And uh, he's a good Christian. And uh, my joke is that in the Tenth Commandment, there are a number of, uh, you might say, clauses. And one of them is, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's ass. And I have never coveted my neighbor's ass. And I tell him that. So that must make me a good Christian, right? Uh, so, um, yeah, so covetousness is wanting what um, somebody else has. And then uh, ill will is wanting something negative to happen to another person. Um, 
wanting them to uh, everything from losing money in the stock market to maybe being in a crash or whatever, losing their job, whatever. Uh, and then wrong view is not questioning the Dharma. It is saying that the Dharma is wrong. There's a difference between questioning and saying that there is you know, no such thing as karma. It's just a myth. It's made up. So if you can uh, engage in virtuous actions, this will create happiness. And uh, again, you want to have uh, the causes of virtuous action too. So very simply, here is a quote from uh, Galwan Karmapa. To secure our own happiness and causes of happiness, we must first act to create wholesome causes of happiness. We must create virtue. We must engage in good conduct. We must generate wholesome attitudes. These are important. So I'm scrolling down here to see what else I have. Um, Well, here are some more positive qualities. Uh, first of all, life is change. I think all of you are probably aware of this, that change is constantly happening. Impermanence is constantly happening. That uh, it's so easy to... Um, get upset or uncomfortable when change happens. And change can be anything from getting a flat tire to uh, disaster. But this is, you know, impermanence means that there's going to be change. Uh, that uh, things do not stay the same. And if we can accept that. It's interesting that uh, you probably have health insurance. You probably have uh, uh, some type of property insurance. You have auto insurance. You might have possibly uh, income uh, loss insurance or life insurance. And there are a lot of other types of insurance that you could have. You could have liability insurance. So you have these things and then something happens and you use it. And it's amazing how you feel that somehow or another you've gotten the short end of the deal that, uh, well, this is the way the mundane world works, that things break, things uh, uh, don't last, that, uh, uh, well, I have a saying, I've owned this place for 53 years, and my saying is because of impermanence, maintenance is permanent. And uh, this is the way things are. And uh, if we can accept that, uh, we don't have to get so upset when things do break, when the car needs work on it and uh, the house, you need to call a plumber or whatever. That uh, This is the way things work. And... Uh, if we can accept that, things will go a lot better. So that is one thing. And another is gratitude. I touched on this this morning, that if we really look at uh, 
what's going on in our life, there is so much to be grateful for that um, uh, and whenever I come back from India or Nepal or China, I feel a lot more gratitude towards this country than I did uh, when I left. That uh, uh, we do have, and it doesn't mean that things are perfect, but we I have a road system where I can get in my car and I can travel. Uh, and... Uh, there's a joke about Minnesota or Wisconsin that that is their two seasons, winter and road construction. Uh, but uh, they uh, the roads are passable. They're plowed pretty well in the wintertime, all things considered. Uh, I've got a good uh, company that supplies electricity that is very rare to have any significant outage. And um, there's so many things that work well in my mundane life uh, that uh, overall people are kind and uh, that uh, um, things just go well for me as long as I don't start thinking, oh, poor me, poor me, poor me, why can't I have this or why can't, yada, 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 that, that there's little gifts that are happening all the time. I, uh, Karmapa talks about interdependence. And uh, I noticed, I like to snack on nuts uh, roasted nuts. And so I looked at the package of nuts that I, I like to get. And uh, it was very interesting to just show the connection of how people all over the world are working so that I can have roasted nuts. That the company is uh, owned by Hormel, which is famous for spam, uh, which is almost a joke. Uh, and uh, so it's uh, the the, uh, the name on the jar is Planters Peanuts, and then it has the country of origin, and only one nut is possibly grown in the United States, but uh, things like Vietnam, Indonesia, Brazil, some African countries, uh, and um, India and so forth. That's where these are coming from. And then, of course, there are people in those countries that have to work to make plant the nuts, cultivate them, harvest them. They need to be shelled, uh, roasted, and so on and so forth. And these people all need food, clothing, and shelter. And uh, in me buying one box or bottle of nuts, People all over the world are benefiting me that I'm touching by buying this particular product. And we can feel gratitude towards these people all over the world that are doing things and working hard so that we can uh, enjoy whatever it is, product that we use, whether it be food. A lot of, you know, clothing is made in uh, outside of the United States. I guarantee you this cell phone wasn't made in the United States uh, and on and on and on that we uh, are benefiting from uh, what so many people do around the world. And we, when we look at it, our own situation, it might not be as good as we would like it to be, but it's pretty darn good overall. So gratitude is really important to be grateful and to, um, to appreciate. Uh, it might even be good to uh, just start writing down things sometimes about uh, what you feel grateful for. And then uh, contentment is another uh, that I like to talk about. Um, 
and this again is from personal experience that when I uh, moved out here within a few years, had horses, would ride them in trail rides, belonged to a, uh, a saddle club and uh, uh, we'd ride them in parades. And uh, so I was married and uh, you might say enjoyed these horses a lot. I had a neighbor about a mile and a half down the road that in the evening, uh, he's a dairy farmer. Would my former wife and I would ride down to his place, talk a little bit, have a few snacks, and then ride home, and um, and so forth. And uh, then I started realizing, well, besides the horses, that uh, well they needed to be fed. They could be out in pasture part of the year, but then you need hay for the winter time. And uh, either you buy the hay or you make the hay. So to make the hay, you needed a cutter, a mower to cut the hay. Then you needed a, a, a rake to rake the hay into uh, what are called windrows. And then you needed a baler to go down and bale the hay. And then you needed a tractor to operate the machinery with, and then you had to stack it in the barn, and then you had to get it from the stack to the, where the horses would eat it. And then there was manure in the uh, barn that had to be cleaned out and spread on the fields. And then uh, there was veterinary uh, supplies, hoof trimming, fencing, and a few other things. And eventually I realized that it was a lot easier to not have the horses and to just uh, enjoy being out uh, in the woods on the land that they were pastured in uh, and be content with that. That we don't have to make uh, life complicated to be content. That uh, content actually comes from simplicity. That uh, when we simplify things, it's easier to see the contentment. And uh, just to show you how my mind works, this brings me to Chinese fortune cookie fortunes. Uh, and um, uh, the one cookie fortune that I got when I first started meditating was simplicity of character comes from um, profound thought. And I uh, have always thought that was a good fortune. And then another one, I got this when I was having lunch at Karma Ling with Kenpo Carter Rinpoche. There were a number of us there. And after lunch, uh, somebody brought out a large box of probably commercial size box of fortune cookies that a restaurant might have. And we each reached into the box and grabbed our fortune cookie. And uh, mine said, uh, to see your drama is to be liberated from it. And I think this sums up what I've been talking about today, that if we can see our drama as drama, no problem. So that's a little bit about contentment. Uh, again, I'm just kind of going over a few final points here that uh, uh, we want to have unconditional love and compassion for ourselves and for others. It starts with ourselves 
And once we understand what it is, it's very easy to have it for other people. But if we don't have it for ourselves, it's very difficult to have it for other people because we really don't understand it. That uh, we need to be able to uh, uh, just accept ourselves as we are, see our warts and everything, and then work with that to uh, reduce our faults and increase our qualities. That, um, again, be like that loving mother that nurtures the child. We can nurture ourselves. We can be kind to ourselves. Uh, humor, as was as I said, can be really uh, releasing. It can release stress. It can release being too tight, too strict. Um, I'm looking for a last few words of wisdom here and uh, um, I guess all that I have to say, I've said already, uh, anything else would just be uh, uh, re repeating. Well, I guess this is worth saying, and that is that um, our Buddha nature is in the seed stage, and that um, a seed never sees the flower. That if you stay a seed, you're never going to see a flower. And so you have to uh, you have to get out of being a seed, which means going into new territory. Trumpet Rinpoche would talk about the cocoon. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Uh, but the idea was that uh, a, uh, a caterpillar makes a cocoon around themselves out of the, actually their bodily secretions. He didn't talk about that, but it's a stage that they go through to become uh, a butterfly. Cocoons are usually associated with moths, by the way, but it doesn't matter. And then if you're going to have wings and fly, you've got to get out of the cocoon. And when you're in the cocoon, you don't know what it's like outside of the cocoon. So it is, uh, it is important to realize that you have to have a certain amount of courage to get out of the uh, cocoon, to let the seed sprout and flower. And um, on that note, I want to show you a moth that I took a picture of that showed up one night in my window. So I'm going to go to this. You can see that now. And let me get, see if I can get it to go. How about that for a moth? I think yeah, that's big. I think that's the biggest moth that is native to the United States. And as you can see, he uh, is tame. He liked me. You can hear the birds too. 
So uh, that's what you want. <laughs> Escape the cocoon and uh, fly. And with that, I'm done. Any, any comments, questions? That was a wonderful teaching, Lama. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Lama Karma. Um, I thought that was a butterfly. It's a mo moth. That was actually a moth. Moth. Oh. I'll, I'll tell you why. I'll go back to the picture here. Um, let's see here. Um, okay. It's in the antennae. If you look on this, the antennae are, um, they look a bit like a, uh, a fern. It has little um, branches on each antennae. Uh -huh. And a butterfly, it's just a single strand. What is the underneath? Oh, it's your, your hand. That's my hand. I'm joking. <laughs> that gives you an idea of the size of that moth. I was like, a moth is eating a huge you know, yes. piece of bread. Yes. I, I had time to sense of humor, that's all. Yeah, yeah he, it came to my window in the kitchen, and it's a it's an awning window. I don't know if you people know what that is. The, the window would open like this. Mm. And so... The screen was on the inside, so I just shut the window like that, and I had them trapped. And then I went out in the morning, put my hand up there, I grabbed it, and then I took the picture of him, the video of him on my finger, and then I let him go. Wow. Thank you. Sure. Um, now, would any of you like me to send you a copy of that prison break meditation? You mean teaching or did you that, write that, something? That little Tong Len that I gave, that little Tong Len exercise. I, I would love to have it. Okay, I will send you a copy. Uh, does anybody else want one? Okay, that's fine. Oh. <laughs> Did you say yes? Uh, Haley, did you say you have one, right? I have I have several copies of that meditation already. That's what I was yeah. thinking. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I'll send you one, Lama. Thank you. Sure. Well, with that, then I guess we could dedicate the merit. And uh, maybe... Uh, would be best if I put something up on the screen. Let me see what I can find to put up on the screen. Just bear with me here a minute. While you're doing that, I just wanted to say thank you for this. And um, yeah, I, I really appreciate that you give these teachings and um, my mom's here. That's Lori is my mom. And, oh, uh huh. Yeah. So I don't know what she's doing right now. If she's actively, I don't know if she even wants to talk or be on camera. But <laughs> it's, nice. it's just nice to get to listen to what you have to say, and mm -hmm. it has a positive influence on everybody. My mom just messaged, "I am here." Yep. So <laughs> I see that. Yeah, I see that. Hi, mom. <laughs> yeah, hi, mom. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Same here. Thanks so much, Lama. And I'm looking forward for your next Zoom teachings. And it's so liberating. And, uh, you know, especially uh, someone has been in Cambodian, but she's a very close student uh, and has so much blessing. And you are, once again, as I mentioned there to Wisconsin, uh, you know, KTC. I mean, we heard about KTC when I visited. You are very special and uh, uh you know um they i never seen uh have a sense of humor like you not just for teaching but also like uh, when you and i talk on the phone and we laugh a lot half of this like uh, we laugh so it, it's it's wonderful but the the how you present the teaching like you know 
what is it, you know you have always like story to talk about and these are so unique and we are very very uh lucky so please uh have a long life and continue to teach and uh, looking forward to next okay yeah he said <laughs> oh yeah my yeah mom and yeah. my boyfriend liked your teaching so good <laughs> Yeah, it says. Uh, yeah, it says. Uh, I will read it. You know. Uh, how do it, maybe Haley? You can read it. There are some nice uh, comments. Jacks, so, or like says, thank you very much for your teaching. I mm -hmm. love the very every moment from it, and look forward to the next one. Blessings. Then your mom says, thank you. I have heard so much. Mm -hmm. I guess about you. About you from Haley, and you have given her uh, so much wisdom and enjoyed your teaching. Oh. Definitely. Um, no, I got jealous. <laughs> <laughs> you see? Well, you're making we're talking about envy, you're making right? laugh. You, were, you were talking about envy, so here's the. <laughs> that's a sense of humor, right? Yeah. yeah uh, okay. So. All right, Lama. Yeah, I, I just will say this before we do the dedication. Um, when I was 40 years old, the last thing I would have thought was I would become a Buddhist monk. That would have been the very bottom. Mm -hmm. That, uh, But uh, things happened. And I've heard there's a saying, when you're ready for the guru, he is there. And um, it... Uh, when I met Kenpo Carter Rinpoche, it was in Chicago. He was the first Tibetan that I ever met. And um, I think he saw me coming. That's what I can say. And I feel so fortunate. And as a result of that, I've met you and so many other great teachers. And uh, well, I'm going to quit before I get teary. <laughs> So here is the dedication, and so nam di yi Again, thank all of you for being here and may you all benefit and everyone you come in contact with benefit from this teaching today. Thank you, Lama Yeshe. Thank you, Lama. Long life. Long life. See you soon. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye. Good to see you, Lama Karma. <laughs> <laughs>